Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program uh, here at CSIS. And I have a confession to make. I have been looking forward to this conversation for a very long time. Not only do we get to uh, do the public unveiling here in Washington of a new CSIS report, Russian soft power in the 21st century, but we also, I think, sort of have a public unveiling of a brand new ambassador uh, here in Washington. And I, we could not be more delighted to welcome Ambassador Marina Calderon here to Washington. Uh, guys, I have to do this. First female Estonian ambassador to Washington. We like it. We like it. <laughs> And uh, Marina, if I may uh, be so uh, American and informal, uh, has been so gracious uh, in, in helping us uh, unveil this report. She, and I told her, we had an opportunity uh, uh, to, to be at a dinner together last evening, and I told her she was heaven sent, because if there was one person that could help us understand the complexities, it is you, Marina. So uh, this was perfect, and uh, we could not be more grateful uh, for you. But I'm going to save Marina for a little later. Um, what I'd like to do with the time we have this afternoon is give you an overview of our new report. We released this report last month in Tallinn, uh, it actually and to a briefing in the Foreign Ministry, um, which I think provoked a very interesting discussion within Estonia about the report. We then went to Brussels to brief um, uh, the report. Uh, but I guess we could argue we'll save Washington, save the best for last. And uh, this is the final series in, in, in the public briefings uh, for, for our report. So you're going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to beg your indulgence. I'm not going to spend a very long time on the overview of the report. It's very hard to give an, uh, an encapsulating <coughs> review of a 52-page report uh, with a lot of statistical uh, uh, analysis. But I wanted to give you some of our takeaways, and then, as I said, uh, let's immediately turn to uh, Marina and a, and a nice conversation. So I'm going to see how we do this here. OK. So this project, actually, uh, I had the privilege of ending the project. I didn't have the privilege of beginning the project. Uh, Dr. Sarah Mendelson, who was the director here of, uh, of our wonderful Human Rights and Security Initiative, uh, conceptualized this study. Um, it was to look at, uh, and using the Joe Nye uh, definitional uh, quantifying of what soft power is, we wanted to take a deep dive and look at if there was Russian soft power uh, in Estonia, and to determine its efficacy, if you will. Was it having an impact, and specifically on the younger generation um, of uh, both uh, young Estonians in Estonia, young Russians in Estonia. Um, and we really wanted to see that next generational element uh, of that Russian soft power. And, and I raise uh, and, and look at this because I think it's important for this definition. How we uh, analyze the Russian soft power was to look at the Russian compatriot policy. That was what we, the instrument we took to, to develop that. And I'm going to talk a bit about the compatriot policy and, and specifically how it uh, functions uh, in Estonia, but I wanted to give you that definition. Some of the elements of the compatriot policy do not fall neatly into the Joe Nye definition, but again, that, that attraction of culture, the language, the ideas, certainly does. And, and I'll highlight where we sort of deviate a bit from, uh, uh, from Joe Nye's uh, definition. Again, our project uh, goals were to examine Russian soft power using that compatriot policy. Again, the relationship between the Russian diaspora to, uh, to its homeland. And again, we used a lot of survey work uh, to determine and quantify that impact. We really initiated a very comprehensive survey in 2009 and 2010. Again, this was under uh, Dr. Mendelssohn's leadership, as well as the co-author of the port, Dr. Ted Gerber. He's my wingman. He's not here with me uh, today. He's a sociologist by training, and he did all the survey work and all the data. So I'm going to give you the snapshot of that data. Oh, but please don't ask me about methodology. I'm probably not the best place to, uh, to speak to that. But what I want to focus on is the size. 3,000 individuals were interviewed between the ages of 16 and 29. And again, 
those, you know, approximately a thousand, a thousand, a thousand uh, young of young Estonians in Estonia, young Russians in Estonia, and then uh, young Russians in Russia. So we got a nice, nice bit of, of data. So let me begin a bit. Uh, for those of you who are, who are quite familiar with Russian compatriot policy, please forgive me, but I want to do a, a brief uh, overview. If you read the literature, there's an estimate of about 35 million uh, compatriots of Russia, uh, the Russian compatriot policy that live in 90 countries. Approximately half of that 35 million, however, uh, reside in the Baltics and the other former Soviet states. So it's certainly a concentrated uh, policy uh, in the former Soviet space. It began in the early 1990s as a drive for citizenship and resettlement, the dual citizenship. Not very successful, uh, to be honest. And then in 1999, uh, the Russian Federation adopted uh, its state policy towards compatriots living abroad. It's a quite broad definition. It's, uh, it encompasses Russian Federation citizens that are living abroad. It encompasses former citizens of the Soviet Union, Russian immigrants from either the Russian Federation or the, uh, or the USSR, descendants of compatriots, and then a very, very broad category, foreign citizens who admire Russian language and culture. Well, I think that encompasses, certainly, I'll raise my hand, uh, certainly I'm a great admirer of, of Russian culture and language. And then in, in 2010, the, the compatriot policy was updated once again to, uh, I think, sort of solidifying it, uh, institutionalizing it, that uh, to be a compatriot, it was important to be certified by a respected civil society organization, or you had to be engaged in activities that promote uh, compatriot policy. So, you know, in a nutshell, the objective of the policy is clearly to promote Russian culture and language, the classic definition of soft power. But I think what, what stands uh, unique to the Russian compatriot policy are its two other objectives, to fight the falsification of history and to protect the rights of compatriots. Now, how does that work in, in function? I, I think, in, in, and we will walk you through a bit of how we came to these conclusions, that really the, the, the goal of the compatriot policy is to keep the communities separate from society. We felt that was a very important tool. If you separate them, give them different uh, media streams, uh, do not allow that integration, uh, that in, in fact uh, in, uh, empowers Russia's soft power or increases its power. It's also, I think, a benefit of, of legitimizing uh, the historical, uh, the Great Patriotic War. Uh, I think Russian soft power will confront, uh, sometimes very dramatically, if it feels that that narrative is being questioned. And this, of course, is at the intersection of the Baltic states, whether you are, are a liberator or an occupier. And that tension plays out continually. I think another benefit of, of the compatriot policy is to counter Western criticism of Russia's own uh, uh, internal human rights democracy situation. Interestingly, it quite often uses Western techniques to criticize, in this instance, uh, Estonia's uh, treatment of minorities using a lot of international tools, OSCE, European Court of Justice, U European Court of Human Rights, uh, in a way to, I think, counterbalance uh, criticisms that it receives from the West. So that's a very broad brush overview. Uh, of, the, the, of the compatriot policy. So in our analytical work, we broke this down into five areas where we saw the greatest exertion of influence and Russian soft power. Use of NGOs, media, political influence, legal action, and then the use of the Russian Orthodox Church. By far, the use of NGOs uh, is the most potent uh, element of Russian soft power, in my view. It's certainly their most extensive tool, uh, it, it, really through two vehicles, the uh, Ruski Dome, Russia House, and the Ruski Mir Foundation. Again, a broad network, a growing network, uh, 50 centers. In, in some of the literature, it said by 2020, we may see 100 centers. The budget is growing. Uh, in fact, we may see centers certainly increasing in the Baltic area. So this is in, in, in becoming a, a larger effort. It is how culturally they reach out to one another uh, uh, through language classes. Uh, and the stated goal, again, is to popularize Russian language and culture. Again, the classic soft power tools. It is a very youth-focused 
uh, agenda, looking at sporting camps, uh, sporting events, summer camps, exchange programs. This is certainly a, a broad brush uh, area. And I think it's quite interesting, in uh, the recent Russian national security uh, strategy, it noted that patriotic education is an element of Russian national security. So this is very, very important, patriotic education, this cultural and language experience. The media. Uh, in one interview, uh, an Estonian official told us that, you know, it's very hard to reach an audience when they're getting their information from different sources in a different language from a very separate media channel. We found up to 30 periodicals, five television stations, uh, certainly a, a, a use of radio. Um, this is a, a very powerful tool, again, supported by the, the NGO network, the Ruski Mir Foundation. We're seeing an increase in funding broadcast advertisements, and again, a very youth-focused message, mixing very popular music uh, with some commentary on history. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's a very attractive tool uh, for the next generation. It's certainly uh, growing in popularity. So again, a very effective tool of, of Russian soft power, in our view, and its effectiveness in Estonia. This is where we begin to deviate from the classic Joe Nye definition because it's not uh, using money overtly to influence, but here in the political party dimension, we certainly have seen some uh, both overt, and I would say a bit more covert, uh, financing of political parties in the Baltics, certainly in Estonia, with, uh, and, and throughout, again, we can make some comparisons of Russian compatriot policy across the post-Soviet space. I think these five categories that I've outlined some, uh, in some countries, they are stronger uh, tools than in others, uh, but certainly you see a uniformity of Russian soft power and its use in politically influencing. And perhaps we can uh, ask Marina a little bit. Uh, in fact, in March of this year, prior to Estonian national elections, there was a controversy about uh, receipt of foreign funds uh, prior to the campaign to the center party, and that caused quite a controversy. So again, we do see this as a tool. It's successful. It can be more successful in other countries. It, in this particular case, where a $1.5 million euro contribution uh, to Mr. Savisar was actually a, a, a political, sort of caused quite a controversy and perhaps, uh, I think, certainly changed the dynamics before the Estonian national elections. This is what I was alluding to, so this very interesting twist. Um, the extensive use of uh, legal action and through international organizations to file claims on behalf of the Russian diaspora. We've seen, and, and this is where I have to, uh, truth and advertising, I in the European Court of Human Rights, you don't know who the filing country is. You only know the country where, you know, to the, f the complaint is being made. So we know that more than 800 claims were brought against Estonia. 98% of those were inadmissible. I can't tell you for sure that those 98% are, sorry, th those 828 came from Russia, but I have a fair certainty that a strong percentage of them did. But I want to be very truthful in saying we don't have that statistical uh, data point. Clearly, this is, uh, uh, from a foreign policy standpoint, uh, senior Russian officials have been very clear that they're going to use these entities to draw attention to the negative humanitarian situation in Latvia and Estonia. We certainly see uh, at the OSCE in particular a lot of use uh, of by Russian diplomats to highlight uh, Russian minorities and their treatment uh, in Estonia. Finally, the Orthodox Church. I have to confess again to you, this was an area that I wasn't quite familiar with. I mean, I certainly had been very uh, uh, recognizing of the growing elevation of, of, of the Orthodox Church, uh, certainly within Russia, but I had not realized in Estonia that it does touch the daily life, whether you get your new car blessed or your new apartment blessed. There is an element of the church in daily life, and the use of uh, the Orthodox Church, again, to reach out to, uh, to the diaspora. Again, it is a different strength uh, in a different country, as it were, uh, but we did find some, some mild, uh, certainly some, some influence uh, in Estonia. Now, here's the part where I, as I said, I need my statistical sociological wingman here. What I wanted to do is give you a couple of snapshots of the statistical data and do a very brief overview of really the assessment. And again, part of our work was to determine 
the efficacy of Russian soft power. Was it working? Did it have an effect, and particularly on the next generation? I think there was an assumption that some of these historical issues and tensions would dissipate with the passing of an older generation that would not have been so uh, associated with that. I have to tell you, absolutely not. These have all passed to the next generation. So this is, this is a problem that's not going to go away. If anything, it has already been transferred to the next generation. So again, let's remember the objectives of the, of the compatriot policy. It's uh, certainly trying to uh, fight the falsification of history. And again, that history is very much related to, uh, to, the, to the Soviet liberation uh, of Estonia. And uh, again, I, I know these are very loaded historical terms. I, I, I just want to provide uh, that in context. So one of the questions that the survey asked, did Stalin, Stalin may have made some mistakes, but overall he did more good than bad. And I hope you can see the color key. The green is, in, uh, is uh, the, the cohort that we asked of young Russians in the Russian Federation. The blue bar represents uh, young Russians in Estonia, and then the red bar is uh, young Estonians in Estonia. You can, you can see again the strongest, this is the most strongly agreed with that statement, 15% in the Russian Federation. Uh, you can see where strongly agree Estonians. That's a very different interpretation of their history. So you can see again those dynamics. What's so interesting to me is that last category. Hard to say. Look at that. It's sort of even percent of not sure. Hard for me. So there is again some some ambiguity there. But if you're trying to, part of your soft power is to, in, you know, ensure your history is glorified. That may have some, some nuances, but we're certainly seeing the polarization, if you will, of the next generation of, of those types of questions. Question two, and again, I, th you have all of these in the report, and there are, there are charts and charts and charts with so much interesting information. I'm just highlighting a couple of the few. Should the Russian government intervene to protect Russians living in Estonia, regardless of citizenship, so whether they are uh, Estonians that hold the gray passport, the alien passport, or actually have a blue Estonian passport. Again, very interesting, and I'm going to caveat this. The, the young Russians in Russia said, you know, 48 percent of those, yes, the Russian government should intervene. Here was a funny thing that happened. When our survey work, when we went to Russia to interview the approximate thousand young Russians living in Russia, only 25 percent really went through the whole course of questions. Why? Because the questioner was making them so mad. They're like, why are you asking me all these questions about Estonia? I don't care about Estonia. I don't know anything about Estonia. And so the, the, the folks that were taking the survey thought, OK, we're going to get really skewed results if we take this survey the whole way through. So really, only 25% of those young Russians and Russians really had enough knowledge, quite frankly, patience, to, to go through the whole survey. So that tells you, again, where the thinking is. So, 48% of them said yes, but that was only a very small band that actually could, could go through the survey. Again, you're seeing the, uh, the very broad dimension. As, uh, young Estonians said, you know, definitely no, the Russian government should not intervene. So again, you see that, that polarization. Does the Russian government, uh, okay. What influence, if any, does Russian government statements and actions have on the actual situations of Russians in Estonia? The reason this question was asked, we really wanted to get to you, did this really impact your daily life? Do you feel this? Do you see this? Again, uh, let's, let's check the uh, Estonian data. What influence? Only 5% said very negative, 49% said somewhat negative. So young Estonians in Estonia feel this is a negative uh, influence. However, uh, I, and this is the big thing to, to be concerned about, the young Russians in Estonia, 54% said, don't know, don't feel it. I, they're, they're, they don't see where that Russian government potential intervention or influence is there. So is that soft power reaching them on a daily basis? Unclear. Which of the following places do you feel the strongest connection? This is about identity. Where do those young people in Estonia, where do, they, where do they belong? And this gets back to sort of the origins of the Russian compatriot policy of, you know, resettlement coming back home. Again, very interesting. 52, 47% uh, of young Russians in Estonia, Estonia affiliated where their strongest connection are their town, their village, their city. 
as did, of course, uh, the, uh, the young Estonians in Estonia. This means that if there's not a, I, I identify or want to be you know, back in the Russian Federation, I identify with my home where I've grown up, and that's Estonia. And we felt that was actually quite an encouraging sign of that, of that identity. What proportion of your friends' acquaintances are Estonian and what proportions are Russia? This is, again, the question of separation. And for us, we noted this, this was the concern we shared both with our, our Estonian uh, government colleagues as well as the Estonian think tank community. We're not seeing much mixing of these young Russians and young uh, Estonians, particularly not in the workplace. And again, if you're not seeing one another, if you're not dealing with friendship bonds and you know, you're not on Facebook talking, you're friending everybody, you tend to separate yourselves and then that's where you don't have an appreciation for what the other one is feeling. We felt that was important. Although Estonian uh, citizenship uh, rates have been very encouraging, this separation, that's a long-term concern because if these communities remain separate, they will not be part of building Estonia's future together. And this again speaks to that, uh, what proportion of your coworkers are Estonian and proportion are Russian. They're really very separate in the workplace. They're very separate in their friend and their friendship ne networks. Do you want to stay in Estonia permanently or would you prefer to leave the country? Uh, again, we have this, and this is where we did divide uh, the passport holders, both the, the um, ethnic Russians with great passports, the alien passports, and then those that have citizenship uh, have the Estonian passports. Um, you can see, again, those with the blue passports, 47% want to stay in Estonia. The Estonia, that means let's build our future together, and we were, we were heartened by some of those, uh, those statistics. So the assessment of the efficacy of, of Russian soft power, it's a mixed picture. I think it's quite good in the, its, its dissemination, its NGO network is very powerful and strong and growing. Its use of media, very powerful, very effective. Um, we certainly had a sense through the whole survey work that the Russian-speaking population did have a better view of Russian policies. They actually had a better view of Russia economically than young Russians in Russia did. That was very interesting, so we think that media influence paid off. Again, though, a very small proportion of young Russians in Russia really had a knowledge base about Estonia. But as we saw, there's still deep, deep divisions historically uh, on issues of World War II that has now simply passed to the next generation. But on the other side, there's no strong identity to Russia. The location of their, their place of birth or their place of uh, where they are living is much stronger. And we just didn't see the residents that Russia's soft power had an, a, an effect on the daily lives of these young people. They didn't feel it or touch it. And you know, as all, a, any u universal young person right now, what do they care about? Graduating, finding that job, that's what's important. It's the economy. And we certainly did not see where Russian, uh, either through the foundation network, that was not having an impact on their lives economically. So we had, uh, this was, I have to tell you, a, a fabulous project, fascinating for me. I learned a lot. Uh, but now we're going to turn to finding out more about Russian soft power in the 21st century. And uh, with that, I'm going to scoot over here, and we're going to sort of do CSIS The View. We're going to do the interview here. Um, time, to yeah, time to switch you on. Now, let me introduce you before we, uh, before we start here. Um, Marina began, uh, well, before the independence of Estonia, she taught law at the Tallinn Economic Technical School, and then when her country uh, uh, gained independence. Even a little before that. And even a little before that. She joined the Foreign Service. She raised her hand and said, I want to be part of this, and uh, joined the uh, Estonian Foreign Service in the Press and Information Department. We have a Fulbrighter here uh, she on a Fulbright sc uh, scholarship that earned her master's degree in international law and diplomacy from Tufts University. And then through a continued her, her education and then returned to the foreign ministry in the Office of International Treaties. The lawyer returned 
uh, and was instrumental in working on the uh, legal documents to, uh, to the withdrawal of Russian troops from Estonia. Uh, after serving some brief stints in, in Helsinki in the foreign minister, she returned back to the legal department uh, where she was the executive director and then ultimately became undersecretary for legal and consular affairs 2001 and 2005. She has served as ambas Estonian ambassador to Russia uh, as well as to Israel and Kazakhstan but did not reside in, in either of those last two countries. And from 2008 to 2011, she was undersecretary for Foreign and Economic Relations and Development, and that's her official CV, but let, may I tell them a little bit about your personal CV. Um, Marina is not an ethnic Estonian. Her father uh, is Latvian, her mother was ethnic, is ethnic He's Russian, is, praise God, uh, is ethnic Russian, and uh, this, you are a third generation though, living in Estonia, and you grew up speaking Russian in your home. So you uh, are the living embodiment of some of our report. So I'd love to begin with just some getting your reflections on what our report said or didn't say, uh, or if there are elements of it that you disagreed with, or were you surprised by anything? And we welcome you. Thank you for being with us. And we're going to jump right in. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm not part of the report. I'm not 29 anymore. <laughs> You're 29 <laughs> in your mind. We're all 29 <laughs> in our minds. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor and privilege. It's my first meeting in the premises of CSIS. I've been in DC only for two months. I'm really new in the city, but I hope that we'll continue our perfect cooperation. And Heather, I would like to thank you personally and also your staff and your other co-authors, Theodore Gerber, Lucy Moore yes. and Michaela David. And is here somewhere. There Michaela is here. Yes. For right for con for conducting the survey and for writing the report. Uh, as much as I know, that's not the first time you're dealing with Russian soft power. You had a very good seminar a year ago, which was chaired by 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 Janusz Bogaiski. Yes. And which uh, which was dealing with soft Russian soft power in. Baltics, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. But this one, targeted specifically at Russian soft power in Estonia, is extremely interesting. You did a great job. 3,000 persons were interviewed. Among them, 16, th those are 16 today, they were born in independent Estonia. Those who are 29 were born in Soviet Estonia, mm -hmm. but it was part of the childhood. I don't know how much do they remember about that. My daughter is 25, she doesn't remember anything. My son is 19, he is the child of independent Estonia. So it was very interesting to see the age group, not only those who were born after Estonia regained independence, but also those who were born during the Soviet times. You see, I did a very thorough work with the report. <laughs> uh -oh. I, think, I think I can publish my own report now. <laughs> Uh, the, the response will be forthcoming. <laughs> <laughs> but I will start with maybe some remarks, and then we can continue. Yeah? Be First of all, the, the term soft power. As, uh, as you explained, and uh, as it was defined by Professor Joseph Nye, for me, it has a positive meaning. For me, it's your ability to get what you want through attraction. When we talk about soft power in this context, that's not exactly the same soft power that was, uh, that was meant by Professor Nye, that was meant by American, and to apply to the politics of America. For me, Russian soft power, which is a mixture of uh, uh, promotion of cultural and linguistic ties, but also a uh, mixture of propaganda, mixture of uh, disinformation and so on and so on, has negative, has negative uh, connotations. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So maybe one of the things we should think about is to use or to think about another term. Should it be strategic disinformation? Should it be strategic misinformation? Should it be strategic miscommunication? Or, if we go back to the language of the Cold War, active measure. 
Because as you can see, the aim of the soft power is not to promote Estonia as a nice country where all Russians or uh, people belonging to Russian ethnicity want to live. On the contrary, the aim is to depict Estonia as a poorest country in the EU, not a very successful country, country that is not a good place to live with a massive violation of human rights. As to the data, 800 uh, claims in the European Court of Human Rights, I don't know exactly, but I think that maybe two thirds could be from foreigners. One third from Estonians. What are Estonians complaining usually about? They're complaining about the too long period of, uh, of, of imprisonment before the sentence is passed and before the court makes, it, makes the ruling. But again, I didn't look into that. I can look it into that later. So that, uh, that concerns the, 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 the term of soft power. And maybe for beginning, what else I would like to say, I, I see lots of friends who know Estonia very well. But for those who are maybe not too familiar with Estonian history, I'd like to say just some facts. We regained our independence in 91, yeah? Which means that we reinforced the laws we had before the Second World War, including citizenship law. Before the Second World War, the population of Estonia, nearly 90% were ethnic Estonians. What we saw in 91 was that the percentage of ethnic Estonians had fallen to 67, which means that during the 50 years of Soviet time, whether I use the term of occupation or not, that's not important here, but during the Soviet years, there was a very massive trend of bringing, I'll use the term Soviets, to Estonia, using the pretext of turning Estonia into successful USSR Republic, the pretext of bringing that agrarian province into an industrial Republic, and so on and so on. And I think that those people who came, they believed it. Although today, if we look just at the facts, before the Second World War, Finland and Estonia were like twins. We had the same level of uh, level of industrial development and level of development. And now let's see where we were in 91. Where was Finland? Where was Estonia? And I'm not going to comment more about that. Whether the 50 years of Soviet era were good or bad for Estonia? Definitely not good. So 91, the percentage of non-ethnic uh, non non Estonians in Estonia was 30, uh, 67, uh, uh, mm. 30, 32. Mm. Uh, after that, uh, today we can say that 7% of our population are Russian citizens. 7% of our population have not determined their citizenship yet. Is it bad or good? Of course we're not completely happy with that. Of course we would like to see each and every person living in our, in our country being citizen of one or another country. Of course we're striving at that. But you just can't take the citizenship and put it on somebody. It's a two-way movement. There, there have to be uh, options provided by the government, and there has to be interest from the other side. What we see today is the diminishing interest. In some cases, even lack of interest to uh, acquire Estonian citizenship. Why? If you look at the conditions, or if you look at the rights in Estonia, the only difference between Estonian citizens and non-citizens is in political rights. And to be more precise, only in the right to, uh, to participate in parliamentary elections. In local elections, everybody who resides legally in Estonia can participate, which is not very typical in Europe. So I think that we're doing very well uh, in that sense. Social rights, no difference whether you're a citizen or not. Uh, social benefits, no difference. Right to education, no difference. And I can continue. So, so we have to find something that makes Estonian citizenship still attractive for those who haven't determined yet. Does Russia help us? Not really. Not in the propaganda work and not in the concrete actions that Russia undertakes. Today, living in Estonia as a permanent 
EU resident without Estonian citizenship is very convenient. You can travel all over EU. You can get established, start your businesses all over EU. And you can travel without visas to Russia. It's a clear benefit, especially for those people who feel ties to their kin state, yeah? who, who feel ties to, the, to, their, to their country. Uh, the recommendations were very good. Yes, I agree. My government has to keep integration still as a priority on the agenda. Have we been successful? Very difficult to say because there are, there's no international, there are no international standards, there is no measurement. We can't say, yes, we fulfilled one, two, three, four, five. We're perfect. We're not perfect. But I think that taking into account all the facts, we are doing pretty well. Do we have to teach Estonian language, as was recommended? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Do we have to do it to uh, adults as well as to children? Yes, but the programs are already going on. There is Estonian language, uh, there are Estonian language courses, not only to children, but also to adults. They are even free of charge. If after the course, you will do the language ex exam. So they are, they are ongoing. Russians and Estonians working together, very good point. But that's something that I would like to ask from, 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 from uh, Theodor, how he was determining that. Because Marina Kailurand, whenever there is a survey, I'm not counted as a Russian. Because usually when Estonian social, uh, sociologists approach me, for them, they look at my family name, it's Kailurand. OK, let's go further, my children. Kaisa Kailurand. Christian Kailurand, who would ever think that they might have Russian blood or they might determine themselves as Russians? How do I determine myself? Yes, I'm Russian. Russian was my mother tongue. My mother is still alive. We still communicate with her in Russian, although she's Estonian citizen, she's perfect in Estonian, but it was very clear for her that her daughter, being Russian, has to honor the culture, the Russian culture, as well as the culture and the language of the country where we live. That's why I was brought up bilingual. Did I lose anything? I don't think so. Did I win? Yes. I love Russian culture. I love Russian literature. And I can read Pushkin in Russian. <laughs> and that's a huge, adva huge advantage. And the final thing, yeah? I, I have so many things to say. Oh. But I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not stopping. No, 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 but you're supposed to ask and I'm supposed to answer. Right. But, there are some, <laughs> but there are some more things to say. Mm, uh, where I would like also you to understand the distinction. It's Russians or Russian speakers in Estonia and Soviets. It's a very big difference. My mother, Russian, she had four classes of education. She, she's not. She, she didn't go to the university. I'm the first generation in my family going to the university. I was born in 62, deep Soviet times. Nobody was talking about regaining independence as we started to talk in the 80s, or as we were hoping in the 40s. But for her, it was very clear. Living in a country, you have to honor language, culture of that country. Clear, no questions about that. What about my other relatives? There was a clear division. There were so, those who, who acted like my mother, and there were those who went only to Russian schools, who didn't learn Estonian language, and for whom I think uh, what happened to, uh, to, to, to Estonia in 91 was a geo, 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 geopolitical catastrophe. Uh, there were those who still thought that Estonia will return back being the Republic of the USSR, and they didn't see any sense in learning the language of the country. And that's the Soviet approach to Estonia. Can we change it? Among those who are of my age and older, let's say 50 plus, I don't think so. Among their children, yes. All my relatives who, are, who didn't speak Estonia 20 years ago are speaking now. All of the children are speaking Estonian. Their grandchildren are brought up bilingual. 
I don't want to say that they are turned into Estonians. <coughs> I don't think I'm assimi assimilated. I think I'm perfectly integrated because I know my roots. And that's the difference. So whenever you talk about Russians, I feel hurt because it's also me you're talking about. But I, I, I would like to just make the distinction between Russians, Russian speaking, and Soviets living in Estonia, if there are any left, maybe a little. OK, I'll stop here. No. Oh, we're not going to stop yet. We've got, uh, <laughs> we've got some more things to, to talk about. Um, I, I wanted to just pull back for a moment. When we briefed the, the, re the report in Tallinn, and I was prepared for, whoa, we're going to hear a lot, because we did uh, make some recommendations and to have the, the government rethink. I, what, was, what surprised me, quite frankly, is that the feedback we got was there was criticism of the citizenship policy simply because it, it was a lot of money, but they didn't feel that those communities had truly integrated. Raising the concerns, uh, and obviously this is very sensitive about the, the, the transition of, of Russian, language, uh, uh, Russian language to Estonian in high schools and the cert teacher certification and things like that, uh, that they felt that perhaps the, the government needs to take a fresh look at how to, as you said, sort of the re-motivate uh, if there's interest in, in doing that. W was that a fair criticism? I was surprised because I thought, uh, uh, I thought there would be more support for government policies, but there was actually some concern. And our report evidently sparked a debate that because people, it's hard for people to look critically at their own citizenship policies. I think it proves we're a democratic country <laughs> <laughs> and people are not afraid of criticizing government. <laughs> but uh, yes, I agree that uh, there is room for government to think, but as I tried to explain, how to make it attractive. Yeah. It's very easy to say, is, is, uh, only criticize bad, 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 but constructive criticism is much better. And that's also something we're expecting from Russia. Like other international organizations and international states and, uh, and other countries, just say that we've done something well and help us. Talk to those people who are living in Estonia. Talk to those people and say that if you have lived there for 20 years, it seems that you want to live there. Why don't you integrate with that society? You will feel much more comfortable. You will be part of the society. You could uh, apply for better positions at work. You could, you could be full participants of the everyday life and of the society. Unfortunately, we don't see that. And there are two powers, our government working in one direction and another government working in the opposite direction. And I have to admit that Russia's propaganda is just watch and learn case. They are doing it very well. They are doing it very well in some parts of Estonia, especially in those parts, Narva, uh, uh, Narva and around Narva, which are populated by, by, by mainly Russian speakers who watch Russian TV. We have not five channels, but I think we have some 35, 45 Russian channels. Uh, they're listening to Russian radio, but here I can say that they're listening more and more to Russian radio uh, programs produced in Estonia, which is a clear shift. Radio 4 is mm. becoming more and more popular among Russians. <sighs> the government has done some things. For example, uh, what is very nice in Narva, it's the college of Tartu University. Our oldest university in Tartu has established some colleges around the country and one of them is in Narva. It was supposed to teach uh, Russian teachers, Russian, lang Rus Russian speaking <coughs> Russian teachers about Estonian history, about his uh, Estonian culture and so on and so on. Because unfortunately, uh, even a couple of years ago, majority of Russian speaking teachers working in Russian gymnasiums were educated not in Estonia, but in Russia. Mainly in Pskov, in St. Petersburg, some in Moscow. So they didn't get their higher education in Estonia. Uh, the Tartu University College saw its same to, to, to explain to Russian teachers the Estonian history, Estonian language, Estonian culture. And the college today, it's much more than just an educational body. It's the place where people meet. It's a place where people have good discussions. I've been in, uh, I was invited there several times to discuss about Estonian-Russian relations and to discuss Estonian foreign policy. And there were different attitudes. 
but the discussion was going on, and that's extremely, extremely important. Some other good projects, Estonian army. It's interesting to say, but uh, boys from Russian families are more eager to join army than boys from uh, with Estonian background. Mm. And that's a perfect place for integration. Certainly in the American history it is. Sports, culture, there are ways, and we're doing, but I agree that everything is not perfect and so much, could be, much, much more could be done, but will be more effective if we do it together, Estonia and Russia. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, let, let's, let's go to 2007, to the Bronze Night incident. You are the Estonian ambassador to Moscow. You have a pretty significant demonstration outside of your embassy. Uh, this is where Russian and Estonian tensions were at their greatest, and we, we go into some detail in the report uh, about uh, the causes of that, but in your words, uh, in your reflections, uh, help us understand the Bronze Night and your own sense of the Russian in you and, and the Estonian. Uh, what was your personal reaction, and obviously what the government was, was doing during those very tense days uh, in April of 2007? You put the picture on the cover yeah. of the report. And that's the bronze night? Yes. Uh, although I think that, yes, we, it was an incident in our bilateral relations. But we'll, maybe we're talking too much about that. Because our relations are 20 years old now with restored independent Estonia. There are so many other things. We should not maybe pay too much attention to that. Because look what's happening in Europe. Look what's happening with the Occupy. Occupy Wall Street movement or Multiculti. In, in Germany, in France. Yes, things like that occur. But I think we shouldn't dramatize, uh, dramatize them. Uh, as to the events in Moscow, of course those events were not nice to see just some thousands of youngsters, ultra-nationalist youngsters, shouting uh, slogans against Estonia. That, that wasn't nice. Uh, and what uh, what we raised with our partners, together with the United States and with EU, wasn't the incident in Tallinn, because each and every person has the right to explain his or her political views, not in the manner that was done there, but okay, they have the right. But what happened in Moscow, it was just a violation of international law. Russia, the country uh, where our embassy was working, is supposed to protect the embassy, the diplomats, and is supposed to create the conditions for normal working of an embassy. And that wasn't done. When, when we left the building, then the uh, Russian, then militia, now uh, militia officers said, sorry, we can't do anything. We have uh, received instructions to stay aside. I had in my embassy some Russian parliamentarians. Even one was Mr. Sur uh, Mr. Slutsky, Leonid Slutsky, who was then deputy chair of Foreign Affairs Commission. He came to the embassy during the time when embassy was under siege. Seizure, seizure, mm -hmm. seizure. And he said that he can stop it in three minutes. But he's not going to do that. Because it's a nice place for Nazis, for the young movement, to, uh, to, to get more experienced, to practice their work, to practice their attitude towards Western countries, and it was pleasure for him to look, to see what was happening in the streets. With my knowledge today, I can say that, of course, it was sanctioned by the Russian government. We don't have proof about that, but as some one Estonian official said very nicely, if somebody barks like a dog, bites like a dog, and looks like a dog, then most probably it's a dog. So, so also in this case, even if I can't say that there was a, any written decree saying go and do that to the Estonian embassy, I have all ground to think that it was authorized and it was uh, conducted from, from, from the highest echelons uh, in Kremlin. So uh, the bronze soldier, uh, that, that wasn't easy. Was, was my government doing that? Was it the best solution? To, to remove the bronze soldier like that. I'm not in a position to comment, I don't know. But I can say that my government took the best decision it could under those circumstances. Before removal, we were consulting with the Russian side. Why not to do it together? 
uh, the sewage wasn't in the right place. It was in the center of Thailand, we've been there, it's, the, it's a trolleybus station, it's, it's, it's not a nice place. Dead people, dead soldiers, have to find their final resting place in cemeteries, in the cemeteries. So the soldier, was the, the, the soldier and the remains of the Soviet soldiers were taken to a military cemetery a couple of kilometers from this place. Was it a bad place? No, it wasn't. If you mentioned the Russian Orthodox Church, I can say that parents of the then head of Russian Orthodox Church, Alexius II, Patriarch of Moscow and Russia, were buried on that cemetery. Whenever Patriarch visited Tallinn, he went to that cemetery. It was a saint place to him. When I met him last, before leaving, before leaving Russia in the summer of 2008, he was saying that he would like to come to Estonia, he would like to go to the cemetery, and he would like to, to, to pay his respect to his parents and to the bronze soldier, the statue and the remains that were removed there. He couldn't. He died later that year. Unfortunately, he wouldn't come later to Estonia. But it wasn't a bad place. When we discussed it with Russian officials, at some point we were pretty close of doing it together with owners, with banners, with military, all military owners, with the participation of Estonian church, Russian Orthodox church, other churches if necessary, because we didn't know who were the, uh, who were the soldiers buried there. Russia state didn't want to do it with us. So that was the situation when the decision was made. And Heather, one more thing, you, you mentioned Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, as I was saying some words about Alexius II, who was the highest, highest Russian Orthodox Church person in, in Russia. He was born in Estonia. He was born in a, as we call it, Baltic German family. Yeah? He, is, uh, he was speaking at home Russian and German. Of course, he was fluent in Estonia. When I, as an Estonian ambassador, at some point being ambassador of a fascist country, met him at the official receptions, uh, either at his place or in other places in the city, we always spoke in Estonian. Mm. The first sentences. Tere tulemast prova suursaadik, tere tulemast teie pühadus. Of course, then we switched either to, either to Russian or, or either to English because there were other people around us and it wasn't polite. But he made it very clear that's Estonian ambassador. I'm talking to her in Estonian. That's the language of the country where I was born. Mm. Uh, when we met in his private residences, we were always speaking only Estonian, although we were both laughing, two Russians in Moscow speaking <laughs> Estonian. <laughs> but that was true. And he, his Estonian was, it was, it was good. It was like the Estonian that, uh, that, this, that, that, that was spoken by those people who returned back from Siberia. They kept the Estonian language of the time when they left the country. So for us, Alexius II, the Patriarch, I think he was, he was a secret weapon. He was a real friend of Estonia. He was doing his best for Estonia, even during the times when nobody came to Estonian embassy and nobody wanted to greet me in the street. He was always talking to me. He was always talking to me in Estonia. So you see, even the Russian Orthodox Church might have, might have different roles depending very much on the personality who's at the head of the church. Fascinating. Tell me, um, what, give me the state of, of Estonian relations, official relations today. Um, certainly we have sense it, it took a, a while to officially uh, come back after 2007. It was uh, a, so one official sort of said it was sort of like being in a deep freeze for a while, but we started to see the culture minister coming, uh, some, some of those official visits. Give us the state of play right now of where Estonian Russian relations are. I will just talk about different sectors because uh, when I was, well, if I, if I ask you, the first word that comes to your mind, Estonian Russian relations, what would you say? Just the first word that comes to your mind. Say something. Bad. Bad. Not very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. That's it. <laughs> but, and now I'll try to. Exp and now I'll try to, try to 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 say that they are good. Our political relations 
are not the best, agree. During 20 years of regained independence, we haven't had any official visits of either president, prime minister, or foreign minister from one country to another or the other way there. We have standing invitation to all the Russian high officials to visit Estonia at any appropriate time. We haven't had. Our VIPs have met uh, at several multi-forums in the United Nations at the meeting of the OSCE, at, the meetings, at, at other meetings. Yes, they have. But no official visits. That's not good. But politicians are doing it ex officio, yeah? So as soon as the political relations change and you tell politicians to become friends, they will be friends immediately. Mm -hmm. It's more important what are people feeling. And when we come to the level of ordinary people, then again, statistics show that more and more Russian tourists are coming to Estonia. More and more Russians are buying property in Estonia. More and more Russians are again rediscovering Estonia they knew before 20 years ago and are introducing Estonia to their children who don't know about Estonia anything. More and more, we're happy with that. Russia's, R Russians are very good tourists. <laughs> and I think each and every country is really happy to have them as tourists. Uh, when we come to the cooperation among uh, administrative powers or ministries, I think it's okay. Even during the years of uh, uh, the difficult months of 2007, our Ministry of Interior, Border Guard authorities, custom authorities, social authorities, MFAs, we're constantly working because we're professionals. We have to work. If it's new, we're neighbors, we have to. And we did it. Cultural ties, perfect. I think that the, even during the Soviet times, there were never so many Russian uh, artists, Russian musicians, Russian theaters visiting Estonia as there are now and vice versa. Estonians are very well received in Moscow, St. Petersburg, in other cities. And trust me, Moscow is spoiled. Moscow has, have, Moscow has 263 theaters. Mm. And to surprise them, it's not easy. But our cultural people still can do that. They are very well received. Economic ties. Russia is our trade partner number four. If you look at Estonian trade, then 80% is done with the EU, 10% is done with Russia, 10% with third countries. Are we satisfied with the 10%? Okay, maybe it might be 11, 12, 13, but not much higher, because not a country wants to have trade too much with one another specific country. You want to put the eggs into different baskets, because it's risky. Even, the, even during 2007, when we had a significant drop in transit, through Estonia. And Russian officials were inviting Russian people not to buy Estonian candies and not to buy Estonian milk products. Russian people were still buying them because they know the quality and our trade was going up even in 2007. So our trade has been going up since 2004 constantly. Now, if we put everything together, then I would say that the political relations are important, but not as important as all the other sectors. Because you can't tell people to be friends on Monday, but you can tell polit politicians to be friends on Monday, and they will be, if it's, if it's, the, if it's the political will. Well, now I'm going to let you in the conversation. I'm having too much fun up here. Um, we have, uh, gosh, we have about 25 minutes or so of, of uh, good conversation, and you have a phenomenal <laughs> uh, interviewee here. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, just please raise your hand. We have mics, and if you could identify yourself, please, uh, in your affiliation, and you can ask a question. You can also ask a question about our report. I'll do, I'll do my best, but yes. she's so much no, more no, no, interesting no, no. than oh, I am. So, uh, and I'm going to tuck around here. Does anyone have any questions? You're going to let me have all this fun. You know, keep, Ambassador Smith, Matt, the mic up here. Uh, thanks for the commentary. I think it oh, Keith Smith with CSIS. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I was CSIS. Sorry, uh, I was in Estonia uh, at the time the uh, withdrawal took place of uh, uh, Russian troops, Russian uh, officers, and helped negotiate. In fact, with the Russian embassy and the Russian officer corps. One of the things that I discovered then was that the Russian government didn't 
didn't really care what happened to the officers. But of course, we had to help the officers more than the Russian embassy would. I could never get the Russian ambassador to cooperate with us on meetings. But, I, I'm going, but uh, going back to some issues, one is the kind of the report. The, the uh, question of, I remember in 19, say 1992, 93, 94, uh, no, 90, I'm sorry, 94, 95 in, uh, in Estonia, the relationship between Est uh, ethnic Russians and ethnic Estonians seemed to me to be quite good, uh, considering all that had happened in the past 50 years. Very good. I mean, there, was, there wasn't any hostility. I didn't see anybody. There were no violent acts against Russian, uh, ethnic Russians. And I think that says something. And I even saw cases myself where uh, if the same thing had happened in Moscow by Estonians, there would have been, somebody would have died. But things that happened in, in Tallinn by ethnic Russians were just dismissed by, by Estonians and let it go. But uh, the, the question of, is there more of a nationalistic feeling among this young generation of Russians than there are in their parents? I have the kind of the impression uh, from some earlier work that Sarah did that in fact there's more nationalism. There's more ethnic, not pride, but I would say uh, almost uh, chauvinism, yeah, by, by the new generation of Russians than there was by their parents and whether that's reflected in the figures. Another thing that re might be reflected in the figures is that people who answer the questions might be people who feel more strongly. Mm. And that those who really don't care or, or don't want to be uh, too accommodating don't answer the questions, whereas those who feel very strongly against. I see that we still see that when the, on the list of Russian enemies, and this is put out every year by uh, one of the Russian think tanks, that Estonia, Latvia, the United States, and Georgia are the four main enemies of people in Russia. Now, I know that in back in 1994-95 when I was in Estonia, you were, the, you, was number one, you were number one and then Latvia was number two. Now we've joined the list. Uh, <laughs> but I just wonder how much also, and the last question is, has to do with uh, television and the influence of television. I noticed that uh, Russia today, RT is all, is all over Europe and in the United States. But I see that it's, it's become much more subtle. And uh, uh, I noticed that even in Poland, I, I go to Poland a lot, that in Poland, uh, RT has replaced CNN in many, in, in many towns <laughs> because it's, it's free. They pay for CNN. <laughs> so when we had some uh, uh, young Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians here, a couple of years ago, and they said their studies showed that ethnic Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians, not Lithuanians, but eth Estonians and Latvians, ethnic Estonians and Latvians were watching more Russian television than they were their own television. Is that s the case, do you think, or is, do you think that's exaggerated? And, and what influence is that having on these numbers? Well, tri triple header, Keith. Uh, so, sort of comments. Lots of questions. Uh, lots of questions on, the, on the Soviet uh, troop withdrawal. Uh, the, you were also in the ministry at that time. And I then was negotiating that agreement. Yes, yeah, I love that. And, that. and then nationalism and uh, the then may, TV. May I start from TV? Sure. 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 Uh, the role of TV uh, during the Soviet time, TV was playing, uh, it was the most important media channel. Most important media channel, no question. Russia today, uh, I'm talking about the, upon the experience I, I uh, had living there. Yes, still, media channel number one. It's a must to watch uh, state-sponsored channels. It's a must to watch nine o'clock Vremia. It's a must. That's the prime source of information. Radio, not so much. Maybe in more distant parts. We might say that uh, to some extent Russian media is free. Yes, they have Echo Moskva. It's maybe listened by three millions, okay, six, seven millions, not more. They have some newspapers, they have internet sites, yes they have, but majority of population is used to watching TV. Now my own experience, during 2007 and during my whole, uh, my whole time as an ambassador to Russia, I tried to go to TV stations on the air, not pre-recorded, but on air. I was allowed twice. Once to a TV show, 
where I was promised that I will get two to three minutes without interruption to say what I want to say. It didn't work out. Uh, second, to the political debate uh, by Vladimir Vladimirovich Posner, Primina, where Posner again promised that I will have some time without interruptions to say what I wanted to say. I didn't get it. Okay, these were my two experiences. All the other times, I was several times pre-recorded, and when I saw the clips of Remia, that wasn't me. It means that I was me, but it was twisted. I started speaking in this jacket and finished in another jacket. So these were all my words and all my sentences. <laughs> but they were put together. And then I stopped doing that. Another channel where I was speaking, it was again Echa Maskul, as I said. They were open, they invited me, and they asked for comments. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, maybe less than 10 million listen to Echa Maskul. It's a niche. It's a niche for certain circles in Russia. So it's very, Russians are very, very TV people. Russians in Estonia. I have the impression that Russians in Estonia are also very TV people, but they are more used to internet searches. They are more, more used to listening radio. As I said, Radio 4 is becoming more and more important. So they have also other channels. But the propaganda that is done by Russian media to ethnic Russians in Estonia, it's so strong. As you pointed out in the report, you have a nice Soviet movie, you have a nice concert, then you have news. If you look at the news, all the sentences are right. But they are given with a twist that the whole picture is not correct. I remember a clip in Vremia about one of the US shuttles coming down. The clip started, another US shuttle will land tomorrow. It's going to be a disaster. Because usually they have problems. They have problems with that, with that, with that. Everything was correct. So it went for about five minutes, and then there was the last sentence. The shuttle landed, and the next news music, or sports, or anything. Everything was correct. You can't say that the sentence was wrong. But the way it was, it was conducted, it wasn't right. Chauvinism among young Russians. What happened on that night, it was a mixture of everything. Uh, yes, those young uh, Russians in the streets were shouting uh, slogans against Estonian sovereignty. They were shouting slogans uh, supporting Russia. Yes, they were doing it. But later when, the, uh, later when uh, our investigators looked at the picture of those who gathered, there were lots of criminals. <laughs> there were lots of well, how to say, uh, not too many young people with higher education. So I can't say that it was the full picture of Russians residing in Estonia. Definitely not. I think it was more uh, coincidence of different negative, negative, ne uh, negative things or matters. What the Russians are doing, young Russians in Estonia today, they have discovered, like me, that knowing three languages, Estonian, Russian, and English, you can get the best job. You can get the best job in Estonia if you want. Young Estonians have discovered the same. Russian is today foreign language number two, studied by young Estonians. English first, Russian second. For long years, uh, second and third were German and French. Now it's definitely Russian. So they are learning more. Are they learning because they want to stay in Estonia or they want to go to other EU countries? I think it's both ways. When, uh, during my uh, three years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I visited approximately 40 secondary schools and all Estonian universities and talked to students. I was invited to talk about development cooperation, but also about Russia. And when I asked the Russian people, what do you want? We want to go to study in America. We want to go to do, but come on guys, not everybody can study in America. Somebody, somebody has to work and somebody has to live also here. So think about your future from that point of view. Not all of you can go to study abroad. If you want to leave the country, you have to also find some place or some work what to do in this country. Do you want to go to Russia? No. We want to stay here or better go to study abroad. But I think it's too early to say what has happened to that trend. Perhaps we have to come to it some years later, maybe some five, 10 years to see what happened to that young Russian generation that was born after 
91 and that wanted to go to Europe? Did they go or did they stay in Estonia? Definitely, they, uh, uh, maybe a small number of them, of them will go to Russia, if any at all. And if you look at the numbers that uh, Heather was showing, there's no hatred among ethnic Estonians, ethnic Russians. There's no, there is no hatred. It's the propaganda. And if you see who is complaining the most about the massive violation of human rights in Estonia, it's official Russia. Then there's a gap. Then Russians living in Estonia. And Russians living in Russia, they don't care about it. Russians living in Estonia, are they complaining really? Again, look at, this, at, at the data, not really. Their concerns are the same as for young Estonians. Education, employment, social guarantees, they have the same interests. During 20 years, we have had several Rus ethnic Russian political parties. None of them has been popular, enough popular among the population to get a vote or a seat in parliament, none. Which means that the interests of population are not divided by their ethnicity. Yes, we can say that central party is more popular among Russians than among Estonians, but it's not a Russian party. It's still, it's multi, multi, multi ethnic party. So maybe that's the question that the division does not go so much uh, by, by, by ethnic My personal view is that they're getting better. My personal view is that they're they getting better. Because if, if I look at my children, they're without complexes like we, we are. They, they are they're, they're completely different. They travel to Russia, they travel to the United States. When they travel to Russia, the first, uh, when we were exchanging groups, when I was ambassador in Moscow, yeah, we were exchanging group of, groups of students, group of children. We always ask the Russian kids who are going to Estonia to come to the embassy so that we can explain what is the country about. For them, it was difficult to understand that the whole Estonia was one-tenth of Moscow, so that the whole population of the Baltics was smaller than Moscow. <laughs> so we tried to explain. The question they often asked was, how can I recognize a fascist, a fascist walking in the streets of Tallinn so that I know I can run away? OK. We also asked the, the kids to come to the embassy after they visited Tallinn. There were no questions like that. From Estonian side. My son was going to, to, he was seventh grade at the time, and his uh, uh, teacher called me, Madam Ambassador, what do you think about our grade going to Moscow? Is it too dangerous if we speak a stone language? Are they going to beat us? Okay, if you can go with the children to the zoo in Riga, and if you can go with the children to a zoo in Helsinki, then you can come to zoo in Moscow, no, no difference. It depends so much on your children, how do they behave? If they are bad guys, they will get beaten everywhere, <laughs> any, anywhere. <laughs> and what was the result after that? After they went back, uh, they were calling us and saying, but, but they are very much like we are. They wear the same jeans, they listen to the same music, they have the same shops in the street. So I think that they don't have the problems, but it's very much in our hands. What do we tell at home? If we continue saying that, Estonians are nationalists, and Russians are Soviets, then, of course, it's more complicated. It very much depends on that, what we tell them at home. My children are free of complexes, trust me. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir, please tell them to the mic there. Okay, hello, my name is Mikhail Kalugin, and I'm from Russian Embassy. Okay. Uh, hello. One remark. Uh, actually, I find some some statistical data from this report very interesting. And I think useful, and of course, some of the conclusions about how to integrate the Russians, or Russian-speaking uh, people, into Estonian society, or how to teach uh, Russian history or history uh, in unbiased way. It's also, I think, very useful recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask, actually, and. Uh, I want to thank Ambassador for very warm words about our Petr, former Petr, and his role in uh, getting Estonia and Russia together. I think it's, it was a very great job done by him. Uh, but I wanted to ask about uh, the words, uh, the comments made by Ms. Conley at the beginning, 
uh, that uh, the official goal of Russian compatriot policy is to keep uh, Russians in Estonia separated. Actually, I don't find, uh, I can support, can't support this thing. And uh, I think if you study carefully all, um, all the comments by Russian officials from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you can say that we urge our partners in Estonia to solve the problem of citizenship. So it's not our goal to <laughs> keep these uh, people separated. Thanks. No, thank you very much. Um, some of the recommendations, and, and it absolutely pulls uh, Maria from, from your comments. Um, you know, young people, regardless of where they are, uh, have a lot in common. And where we found the deepest divisions was the historical understandings. And again, that has been past generation. Uh, you, you do. You listen to your mom and dad and how their interpretation, their political views, their historical views, that we found one way. And again, we were not really speaking of official policy, but how do you get to that uh, where they're working together, they're at the coffee shops together, they're having a dialogue and understanding their similarities and talking through their differences. And we thought one idea would be on, on historical curriculum, having a discussion of the different points of view uh, and how they understood their history. Uh, some very uh, interesting uh, projects I know with the, in the Russian human rights community, they do this, you know, memorial and things like that. You know, how the family, what has happened to them in the past? Uh, and to do a little uh, family research and then to present that to each communities and just to have a discussion. It's just building awareness of, of, the, of, of the differences, but also of, of the similarities. And I think that's the type of innovation uh, in addition to official policy that will be really important. <coughs> Your comment on the separation of policy, it, it was, um, it, it came from our analysis, again, through if you receive your information from a separate source and you're not getting different sources of information, if your communities, and, and let's, let's take NARVA for ex example, if you don't have any uh, ethnic Estonians in your workplace, if you're getting news from a different place, if culturally you're going to go to the Ruski Dome Center and, you're and that's where you're meeting your friends, you're in your own community. And uh, to your point of multiculti and things like that, that's an assimilation issue. We have it here in the United States in some instances when a community can be uh, so separate yet not be part of the larger effort. And, and in part, we felt that that was uh, a, an outcome of, of the uh, compatriot policy, whether implicitly or, or complicitly, that was how uh, explicitly, that was what it was, uh, in part, what was it was doing. And we felt an anecdote to that was to bring these young peoples together, not in formal networks, but at the coffee shops, on the internet, in the Facebook chat rooms. Let's have them talk to one another and see themselves as together they're building Estonia's future, not having parallel communities where the other one doesn't have much influence or role on the other. That was how we, uh, that we came about it. And you're absolutely right. Your comments on the patriarch. You know, I, I, as I look at history, as my own understanding as a, as a former government official, how often does it come down to the personal, the relationships, what that one person can do? Uh, and that's an amazing, and a story that I, sorry, I didn't understand or know. That's a very powerful message, particularly from the, 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 the leader of, of the, uh, the, uh, of the other church. Really amazing, really amazing. I don't know if you have any comments on the, the I, were we right in assuming that there was a policy of separation? Or it's not, uh, we, we over-dramatized uh, uh, that? We officials, we know how to write policies. We can write different policies. We can talk according to the talking points. Our ministers can say what needed. What your foreign minister said a couple of days ago was that, yes, the Western democracies or the Western countries have their rights, uh, have their right to be present in the former USSR region, including the Baltics, but they have to take into account our interests. That was Mr. Lavrov saying a couple of days ago. Uh, what is important is not only what's written in the policies, but what happens in practical life. If Mr. Lavrov would come to Tallinn for official visit, have a meeting with Russians living in Estonia and talk to them, and encourage them to apply for Estonian citizenship, 
encourage them to uh, learn Estonian language. That's something that would make a difference. As long as the uh, different policies and strategies are put on the website, it doesn't change anything. And as to the Estonian language, having met the uh, present ambassador of Moldova in DC, mm -hmm. if you haven't, he's a young guy, I met him a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. he was a journalist in Estonia at the beginning of 90s, mm -mm. end of 80s. He was, Estonia for, he was in Estonia for six months and he learned the language. Journalist in six months. So there are no excuses that people can't learn it in 20 years. And we can write strategies, we can write policies, but we need human touch. And I talked about with your parliamentarians. Why don't you come? Why don't you say Estonia is doing bad things, one, two, three, but give us credit for the things that we're doing well. The only time when Putin gave credit to Estonia, it was, I think, 2009, during the gas dispute with Ukraine, when he said that, look at Estonia, they've been, they've been paying market price for 20 years and are not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I found. <laughs> Because, because, as I said, we're not perfect. There are things we can do much better, but a little encouragement from your side, and we'll be doing much better. I don't know how to come after that. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions or other comments? Yes, sir, please, hold on. We'll get a microphone to you, hold on. And we will make you our very last question. Just a comment, I'm Dick Murphy. I'm a senior associate at CSIS. Uh, I don't think this has anything to do with your government. But to me, a great example of Estonian soft power is the movie The Singing Revolution and how that has been marketed everywhere. I, I get constant emails from the producers of that film telling me when and where it's going to be performed and all of that. And the movie, of course, was dynamite. It was fantastic, and I think it was a, a lot of people learned about Estonia through that movie. Thank you, and it was on uh, WHUT a couple of weeks ago, That's Sunday right. or Saturday prime time. But if anybody hasn't seen, we have copies at the embassy, please send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> and they also on internet, which means that you can download it also from internet. Yes, I, I encourage everybody to, to see the movie. Maybe it's a, a documentary, maybe it's too primitive, but, but it's very human. And it was done by Americans. Estonian um, um, Americans, it, it wasn't done by Estonians. And it makes it even more, 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 more important. Well, thank you for ending on, on that note. Uh, let me thank you, Marina. You are a five star. You're fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing. Uh, we sometimes. Uh, uh, have the opportunity to interview ambassadors and they stick to their talking points. You provided us with insights that... Uh, so if I get fired? Yeah, no, you won't get fired. <laughs> We're not going to allow her to get fired. Uh, no, you won't get fired. <laughs> but uh, you have provided us with great insights. You've helped our research. You've helped us understand uh, this uh, complex but important relationship. I want to thank all of you for spending your valuable time with us uh, today. This was a terrific, as I said, this was the grand finale. We saved the best for last uh, in, a, in rolling out this report and I couldn't have asked for a better friend to help, uh, help us do that. I have some uh, uh, wonderful colleagues to thank as well. Uh, Mihaila David, who was a contributing author to this report. Mihaila is an incredible intern uh, in our program and uh, she's, uh, she's the future and she's spectacular. Uh, Lucy Moore, who's uh, now gone on to graduate school, was also helpful to this report, and my staff, Terry Tolan, Utara Dikpati, uh, thank you all so very much for uh, helping us, and I hope we do more of this, uh -huh. and I hope you'll come back uh -huh. to CSIS, uh, and again, thank you all very much. There's copies of the report, and I think we all better watch The Singing Revolution, so <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.